Hi, this is Professor Paul Knopfler at uh, UC Davis School of Medicine, and I'm a stem cell and cancer biologist. But I also do a little bit of educational outreach, including this video series I have here on YouTube. And today I'm going to be talking about something called brain organoids, which is research that my own lab does, but is also done by many other labs as well. And it's really exciting and I think can provide an uh, avenue into better understanding of uh, how the brain functions and what can go wrong there. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you on a recent post I did on brain organoids and kind of go through that with you. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you like this video or any of the others, uh, also please subscribe. So uh, as I said, I do educational outreach as well as research. And here's the blog I do as part of that educational outreach called The Niche. And it has a number of resources. Uh, so there's the blog itself, but also different information pages for patients or other researchers. And here's this uh, relatively new post I did on uh, brain organoids and why I'm so excited about them. So a good place to start is defining organoids and brain organoids. So what we mean by an organoid typically is a smaller version of an organ. And so for instance, uh, we might be able to make a kidney organoid from stem cells that allows us to better understand what the human kidney is doing in an actual person. We might be able to try out different drugs on the kidney organoid that maybe is a model of a certain kind of kidney disease and see if certain drugs could work in a dish in the lab with a little kidney organoid in there. Uh, and then that might be something that's promising to try on people eventually. Uh, my lab's especially interested in what we call brain organoids or cortical organoids. So these are the little miniature versions of, for instance, a human brain. And so while uh, it's not obviously a real thing, this is not even an organoid, but you can imagine this is a model of a brain. And so with the brain organoids we grow in the lab, they're much smaller than this. They're probably only about this big. And they're made from human stem cells. We typically make them from human iPS cells. And they're not not just like a shrinky dink version of an actual brain. They're kind of like a, a model of the developing fetal brain that uh, doesn't contain the entire brain. And as I said, they're quite small. They might be only five millimeters uh, in size, but they have a lot of features of the developing human brain that make them very useful. So this is what we mean by organoids and more specifically uh, human brain organoids. Here's some that my lab made. The bottom two are just light microscopy version or vis uh, pictures of brain organoids. And you can see they have kind of these lobes in them and they're reflective of the developing uh, human brain. So these were made by human iPS cells by researchers in my lab. We can also cut sections of these and put them on a glass slide and stain them in different ways. And they have the features of the developing human brain in a number of ways, like they stain for certain markers in certain regions. And here's just one that was H&E stained. I thought it was kind of funny. It almost looks like a, a person. Um, so these uh, organoids have a lot of features of an actual brain, like in this case. And so that makes them a great translational model. I already mentioned the uh, potential to do drug testing. So you can imagine with a brain organoid, if you grow them with, say, uh, iPS cells that have been crispr to have a mutation associated with the human gene. So this could be a cancer associated mutation or something related to a neurodegenerative disease, you could make brain organoids that are what we would call a model of those diseases and try out, not only try out drugs uh, to see if you can reverse the, what we call like the phenotype, the disease features, but also you could better understand the mechanisms of uh, that brain disease. So when we're talking about brain organs, a hat tip should go to the pioneer in this area, Madeline Lancaster, who's been really generous with her time, not only for the field to help everyone make better brain organs, but uh, I can say thank you to her myself for helping my own lab get this going. Uh, so they're amazing things, these brain organs, but they do have some limitations at, at this point or their challenges. So one of the limitations is size. And so these, as I said, are very tiny. You know, I, I don't know the exact number, but they might be, you know, uh, one millionth the size of an actual human brain or something like that. And so, of course, you can't have the same complexity there that you have even in uh, an intact, say, mouse brain. 
Um, and so this is something that people are always trying to push. They're pushing the limits on these making bigger organoids. And, and this sort of goes to a second point, and that is that these brain organoids don't have a vasculature in them, right? So our brains obviously need blood. And so these brain organoids also need nutrients. And so since they don't have a vasculature, you just have to get diffusion from the outside in. Like if this was a brain organoid, the media that we grow these, they kind of float in this, this Kool-Aid or ensure like liquid, you know, they have to get everything just by that stuff dissolving in there. And so that doesn't always work very well, especially as they get bigger, the, the middle may be somewhat starved of nutrients or oxygen. So you might get a little more cell death inside. So people are trying to make versions of these organoids that actually do have vasculature. Of course, in that case, there wouldn't be any blood, but maybe the media could flow, the, the food, the liquid food for these could flow through the vasculature. Uh, also addressing this, people have um, transplanted, say, a small human organoid into the mouse brain. And there they found that the vasculature of the mouse brain will actually grow into the human brain organoid. And again, keep in mind, these are really tiny uh, but you might get some more vasculature and blood flowing in that way, and uh, they could get a little bit bigger. Of course, there could be ethical challenges related to implanting even a tiny model of the developing human brain inside of a mouse or other animal's brain, and so that's something that has to be discussed. Most of the cerebral organoids out there, or brain organoids, I should say, only reflect part of the brain, and so they might be more like the front part of the brain. They might be what we call cortical organoids. Some uh, of these brain organoids are more like the middle part of the brain or the hind brain, but typically you don't get all the different regions uh, in one. Uh, as I've alluded to a few times, these uh, brain organoids are more like a fetal brain, so early developing stage of brain. So they're not only a partial brain, but they're kind of immature. So there's, I think there's still some discussion about whether there's any real like electrical activity in there from neurons. I think there's probably a little bit, but I don't know that it's coherent or really reflective of anything meaningful. Uh, uh, recently, there's been new work that was pretty exciting where people could grow these brain organoids with primitive eye-like structures. You can see the images here. So that's pretty interesting. You can imagine in the future um, stimulating these with light and, and seeing if that in some way impacts the growth of the sort of brain model-like component of these brain organoids with primitive eye-like structures, so that's cool. And then even beyond the brain organoids, there's all kinds of other really exciting organoid work more generally. So some of the ones that are sort of my favorites are venom gland organoids, so they can secrete like snake venom into the interior, these little fluid filled spaces inside these venom glands, and that can be used for research or to make like anti-venom. There's tear duct organoids that actually like are crying in a sense into the interior or at least making a tear uh, fluid. And that can be useful for dry eye or understanding uh, different eye conditions overall so, uh, much better. And so I think there's just so much going on with uh, organoids in general and especially brain organoids that it's quite an exciting topic. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll leave the link to this post in the description of the video. And again, this is Paul Knopfler at UC Davis. I uh, hope you enjoyed these videos and please subscribe. Bye.